The other thing that is putting a major chill in the market is what I call the safety in numbers issue. <clears throat> Let's roll it back two years ago. If Mr. Jones wanted to buy an apartment from us on 15th Street, the question never came up, Ken, how many units have you sold? Ken, when are you finishing the building? Ken, do you have financing to finish the building? Do you have end loans available? What's going on in terms of when you're going to be de declaring the plan effective, and when can I move in? These questions never existed. They are absolutely prevalent in the market. So buyers are apprehensive to sign a contract unless they feel, to a large degree, that these items are being addressed. So what we did at Hudson Hill was we knew in order to declare the plan effective, I needed 15% sold. So I took my brave first 12 to 14 buyers, I incentivized them to sign contracts, we gave them a little bit bigger discount, picked up transfer taxes, picked up mansion taxes, and once I was able to go out into the market and tell the public at large that I've got my plan declared effective, I've got financing in place, and equally as important, by the end of July, I had my TCO, and I could start closing on people sometime in October. It changed the market enormously. Now, at that particular property, we had our first closings last week. Again, via the internet, because that's the new method of advertising in terms of residential, I'm not sure if anyone has seen how the printed portion of the New York Times real estate section has shrunk. And um, it's probably this big, whereas probably two years ago it was this big. Now we started to close on people. So again, we sent out an email to about six or 7,000 brokers in New York saying, Hudson Hill, bullet points, financing available, TCO, closings began. This particular weekend, Marathon Sunday, we were inundated with people coming in. And so to a large degree, I think it's a safety and numbers concept, where the first people in the pool are saying, you know, the water's not so bad. I'm going to jump in and, you know, it's okay. These guys are going to finish their building then those guys are going to get the best deals out there. The next people in feel a little bit better because the plan is declared effective, they know the developer has got the money to finish the building, and they can move right in. Now, a perfect case in point is our building we're doing now on 2nd and 77. We have two model apartments we just finished, great apartments. We have a hoist on the outside of the building, which goes up 18 stories. Our elevators are not done yet. They won't be done until the end of December. We've had two open houses. We had 50 people uh, uh, come to these open houses. What we do is we're walking them into a quasi-construction site, taking them up to the third floor by foot. But we feel very uncomfortable taking any of these people in a construction hoist, even though they're signing waivers and putting on hard hats, and they get the feel of a true construction site. So to a certain degree, we realize what we're doing now for the next two months until the elevator gets built. We're basically taking names because none of these buyers, in my opinion, are stepping forward to sign contracts until they know that the building is enclosed 100%, that the elevators are operational, and that they are going to see a lot more construction progress in terms of the building being complete. This is an enormous change in the market from the way it was two years ago. Now, what makes matters even worse is the fact that the media is just ripping residential development to shreds. And I always found it curious that an event took place like it did at 121 West 19th Street, where it was a feeding frenzy. People were buying and buying and buying because other people were buying and buying and buying. The time to buy for people who are qualified <laughs> is now, because you should always buy in a little bit of a softer market as opposed to one that's accelerating. But the New York mentality is just the opposite. People see a friend buying, they think they should buy because if the unit is $1,500 a foot today, it's going to be $1,525 <clears> tomorrow. <throat> it's the anomaly of residential real estate that people buy when the market is hot, not necessarily when the market is chilled. Now, we're also doing another development site, which we are building at 810th Avenue. We bought the old Sony Music Studio, and it's the largest site that we've done so far. It's a footprint of 37,000 square feet. We were one of the lucky ones. We actually closed on a construction loan with Bank of America and Helleba in uh, 2009, in April of 2009. And we are topped out. We have two eight-story buildings with a big courtyard in the middle. And uh, we're going to be starting to market there in February. Again, what I anticipate will happen, we, fit, we think the building will be done in August of 2010. I think that from February to May, we're going to have a lot of people who are going to look. 
but I'm not sure how successful we're going to be in terms of sales because again, people are going to want to see a greater amount of construction completion in the building. That being said, we're still going to do it. We're still going to try to incentivize people to buy. The first people in will pay transfer taxes, will pay mansion taxes, or we'll probably come up with something else as well, maybe give them a housekeeper for a year or something along those lines. But the major change in the marketplace is that people are just not moving to sell, sign contracts until such time as they believe that the buildings are going to be finished. Now, where do we see ourselves from here on in? When we did 810th Avenue, we had to get the foundation in the ground by June of 08 to qualify for the 421A abatement, which we did. But I had some in my office do a very interesting analysis. What we did was we looked at all the excavation and foundation permits that were pulled in April, May, and June of 2008. Obviously, people all wanted to get in the ground. And we tracked those permits to see how many of those permits turned into building permits. So in other words, people had their foundations in. We wanted to see how many buildings were going to be built from there, 20%. So if you had 100 excavation and foundation permits, 20 building permits were issued. So it shows you a couple of things. People can get the financing to build them. People just had no idea what they were doing or a combination of a host of factors. They put their projects on hold. They decided they were going to scale back. So with this in mind, we're beginning to see some pretty good opportunities. Now bear in mind, going back to 2005, where everyone was throwing money at real estate, and people who really did not have the wherewithal, the knowledge to develop, some of those hedge funds, some of those banks, some of those developers were kind of saying, I'm out. I don't have the, where I don't have the money to put in. I want to move on with my life. I want to go back to being a dentist. I don't want to become a real estate developer any longer. So the opportunities that we're seeing are either pieces of land or partially built buildings that we're looking to buy. Now, between my partners and I, we've probably looked at between 12 and 18 of these deals. There's still a gulf between what the sellers want to sell their units for and what the buyers want to buy. The good news is there's an enormous amount of equity out there now that's willing to re-engage in the New York market. This is a major change from six or seven weeks ago. So we are being contacted by all of our equity sources. And they're basically saying that there may not be debt financing available. We're willing to go into these deals for 100% equity. And that's a major change from the way things were six or seven weeks ago. Two weeks ago, we started to get phone calls from about three or four of our lenders, our commercial lenders, who basically have said to us, Ken, if you find the right project, we may be willing to lend again. And the question, of course, was, that's great. At what levels? And at what recourse? Because, you know, as a developer, no one likes recourse. And we've been very fortunate in the heyday is to limit recourse as best as possible. So, as a way of standard, we're looking at a project now where we feel fairly confident there are going to be two very good lenders who are going to be bidding for this job at about $250 a square foot in terms of debt. Now, why is that a significant number? It's a significant number because even though we plan to make these buildings condominium, the banks still don't believe that they're viable condominiums. So what they're doing is they are extending debt to such a level that they will make sense as a rental. So they are lending to you under the assumption that you will move ahead with a condominium development, but they're also taking into account that you might not succeed. So if you think of it, on a typical scenario, if we were able to leverage our deals about 70% a while ago, and now we could only leverage them about 45 or 50%, the returns have to be adjusted. Now, again, we had a great streak. Our returns have always been in excess of 20% in all of our deals. 